Bible tonight. Let's turn to Luke chapter number 18, please. Luke chapter number 18. Uh, I mentioned that song a couple Sunday mornings ago. I was preaching, and uh, I guess it's been a few Sunday mornings ago now, preaching on the touch of God and what the touch of God does in our lives. And God loves you and I way too much to leave us the way that He found us. Amen? Amen. Uh, That's why I believe if you've ever been touched, you've been changed. And if you've never been changed, it's because you've never been touched. Amen? You've never come in contact with Him uh, because He loves you way too much to leave you the way that He found you. And I'm glad for that. Amen? I'm glad that anything good, any change for the better that there's ever been in my life, Jesus Christ did it. And I don't get any of the credit, any of the glory for that. And so I do praise the Lord for the touch of God. Amen? We need His touch tonight. Amen? Amen. We need to hear from Him. And I pray that the Lord will... Uh, will help us. I'm just glad to be here. I'm glad to be in God's house. I'm thankful that He lets us be here. Um, I mentioned earlier that I was in a meeting. I spent the last two days in uh, southwest Georgia in a meeting around Americus, Georgia. And uh, I was able to preach yesterday morning. And then in the afternoon, I kind of decided I'm going to do some sightseeing. And you wouldn't think there'd be too much sightseeing to do down there in the middle of nowhere in southwest Georgia. Uh, but apparently Jimmy Carter's house was only five miles down the road. We were in Plains, Georgia, and so President Jimmy Carter's house was right down the street. So I drove over there, and I got to go through his, uh, they had his boyhood home set up as a little tourist attraction, and I walked through that, and uh, they had a little ice cream place that he would ever frequent, and I was looking for any reason to have a hand-dipped ice cream cone. Can I get an amen right there? So I went over there to Plains, and I thought, well, I'm going to go, I'm gonna go see, on, see on how uh, Mr. Carter's doing. I'm going to go talk to him. And uh, so I went over there towards his house. It's right there in the middle of downtown Plains, Georgia. And um, I got the idea that they did not want me to be there. Uh, they had gates up everywhere and cameras and secret service walking around with earpieces and all that kind of stuff and guns everywhere. So I, had the, I, had, I got the impression that I was not wanted at uh, Mr. Carter's house. Uh, but I'm glad that I'm always wanted at God's house. Amen. Amen. God let us come to church and draw near to him and talk to him. I just wanted to talk to him. I was just going to see how he was doing. I know he's uh, really old, and so I was just going to check in on him. But but, uh, but he didn't want me to talk to him. Amen. But we're going to look tonight uh, at an occasion where people come to God's house to talk to him. Amen. And that's why we've come to church tonight. Uh, And and so let's begin reading. Let's look in verse number 9, Luke chapter 18 and verse number 9. This is Jesus, and it says, And he spake this parable... Unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went into the temple, went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Uh, Every time I hear the word parable, I read the word parable, I think about what I learned in Sunday school, the definition of a parable, uh, and I was told it was an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Y'all ever heard that before? That's what a parable is. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And these stories, Jesus would tell these stories or these fables, you could say, to convey eternal truths much like a preacher, maybe, or a speaker would use an illustration, right? That's basically what these parables were. And this parable is one that is particularly powerful and practical. And it's directed at a very specific audience. It says in our text in verse number 9 that here's who he's speaking to. Unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Jesus is basically dealing with a crowd of people who think that they're better than everybody else. Y'all ever met anybody like that? Amen? Uh, I, I think, sadly, I think that is a scourge. That is something that is prevalent in many of our churches, uh, in my own personal life. I've dealt with that, right, where you just automatically assume 
because of X, Y, or Z, or because of this particular standard, or, or this thing that I have right, it makes me better than everybody else who's wrong about the things that I'm right about. Amen? I think that's just human nature. That's just a tendency that we all have to look down on other people and think that we're better than somebody else. And that's the crowd that Jesus is talking to. So I just want everybody to understand this at the onset. He's talking to you. Amen? Amen? He's talking to me. He's talking to people who are prone to think that they're better than somebody else. Uh, and so I, don't, I, just said that I didn't want anybody to excuse themselves from the passage and think that this parable is not for you. No, he's talking to people who think and are prone to think they're better than other people. So he is absolutely talking to me and talking to you. And it says that they, they trust in themselves that they were righteous and they despise others. The way that we look at other people is a reflection of who we are. Y'all know that thieves think that everybody else is trying to steal their stuff? Liars think that everybody else is lying to them? The Bible says, unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. These people are trusting in themselves and they're despising everybody else and what they're doing is they're projecting themselves, their own, pers- their own hearts, onto the people that they're looking at. Amen? So their despising of others is a reflection of what is in their hearts and they're trusting in themselves and hating other people. It's easy to be impressed with yourself when you're focusing on everybody else. Does that make sense? When you're looking at everybody else, you're looking at their shortcomings and their downfalls, when you're considering the sin in other people's lives, that's a whole lot easier to see than the sin in our own lives. Amen. And so that is the crowd that he's talking to, and I believe that you and I could rightly fit in that category, sadly. And so Jesus is speaking in this. He gives this parable. I'm going to title it this, Two Men Praying. Two Men Praying. I'm sure that, that's a very deep title, very catchy. You'll never forget that one. I'm sure of that. Two Men Praying. But that's what we see, all right? I'm going to break down these two men who were praying. First of all, we see the Pharisee. Look back in verse number 10. The Pharisee. It says, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. In this I see his confidence. His confidence. That the Pharisee stood and prayed. Now, his confidence is not seen necessarily in the posture of prayer, standing to pray. Uh, I know that oftentimes we come down to an altar, we'll kneel to pray, and that's perfectly fine, and the Bible is full of people praying on their knees. But there's, there's no issue with someone praying standing, right? Uh, people throughout the Bible pray standing, so that's not something that is discouraged in this text. But it's not just that he is standing, but, but it's, it's, he's being contrasted with this other man, the publican, who verse number 13 says, he's standing afar off, Right? So you have the Pharisee who's standing, and then you have the publican who the Bible says is standing afar off. And from that, I believe we could gather that this, this Pharisee is standing in a prominent place. And that's what the Pharisees did, right? I don't think we're reading into the text here. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 5, Jesus said, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. This Pharisee positions himself prominently in a place so that he can pray and everybody else can hear that he's praying. Everybody else can see that he's praying. The object of his prayer is is prominence, right? He's trying to elevate himself. He wants to seem better than everybody else. He is a performer. His prayer is a performance. Because he will elevate himself and he wants to be seen and he wants to be heard. And we know who he's performing for, actually. The verse tells us, and he prayed thus with himself. Y'all see that? Verse 11, the Pharisees stood and prayed thus with himself. We're talking about his confidence. The reason why this man could stand and pray so brazenly and so confidently is because he knows the person he's praying to. He's praying to himself. He prays thus with himself. Do y'all see that? He's not really talking to God. I know he begins by saying the word of the name God, but that does not mean that he's praying to God. I think a whole lot of people may stand to pray. They may, they may speak their words as if their prayer is directed to God, but they're not really praying to God. 
Amen? Your prayer to God, well, if, you're, if you really were praying to God, it would be reflected in your posture and in your heart, and yet this man is standing in a prominent place praying to perform, and God forbid you and I ever be guilty of praying to perform. Praying to put on a show. Praying to seem spiritual. God forbid. Amen? It, I think a lot of people do fit in that category. The recipient of his prayer is himself. That's why he's so confident. Because he knows the one that he's praying to really loves him. Because he is praying to himself. Amen? He says, well, I know the one I'm talking to doesn't have any issues with me. He thinks I'm great. Because I'm talking to myself. Does that make sense? So that's what we see this man, his confidence. Secondly, we see his comparison. Look in verse number 11. It says, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. This is what he says. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. His prayer is, is predicated and is founded upon how he stacks up to other people. That's how he's praying. His prayer is based upon how much better he thinks he is to other people. He's comparing himself, right? That's what he says when he says, I'm not as other men are. He, he prays not, not thinking about his own sin, his own self, or where he stands with God. His prayer is coming from a place to where that all he cares about is how he stacks up against somebody else. Why is he praying and why does he have other men in mind? When he says, I'm not as other men are, and it's not even as if he's asking prayer for those who are extortioners. He's not even saying, Lord, those unjust people, they need to be saved. God help them. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, God, I'm so thankful that I'm not as bad as this other guy. Extortioners. Somebody who wants to, to steal right from others. Someone who's wicked, unjust. That's wicked and sinful. Adulterers. Those who are filled with lust. Remember what we said earlier? Under the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. When he looks out at other men, that's what we see from this text. Please get this. When he looks at the world around him, when he looks at other men, what he sees is extortioners, people who want to steal. He sees those who are unjust. He, he, he sees those who are adulterers. And what we know from that is he is projecting that on other people. That is what is in his heart. When you and I look down on other people and we assume the worst... All he knows, he says, or even is this publican. He probably doesn't know anything about that guy. He just knows he's a publican. And therefore, I must be better than he is. I've been preaching a lot the last couple of weeks on pride and prayer. That's what we've been talking about. That's what we've been preaching on, right? I mean, I preached that this past Thursday night or the other Thursday night before a revival meeting out of Micah chapter number 6. And we've been talking about humility and then I come across these verses in my Bible reading today and God just smites my heart again and it may be that we're just not getting it. Maybe that's what it is. Sometimes God will be, God's kind enough to tell me things over and over and over again. I'm thankful for that. Amen? Sometimes I need to hear it once and I need to hear it again and maybe I need to be reminded again a few days later that, 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 that there should be no place for pride in prayer. And that's what this man is doing. He's comparing himself to other people. Listen, when we have pride, and, and look where his eyes are. He's looking at other men, and he says, or even as this publican. What that tells me is he's praying with his eyes open. He, he, he's looking at his eyes, his eyes are outward. He's looking at other people. By the way, when we have prayer time, it's not play time. It's not time to look around. It's not time to play peekaboo with babies. That, that's, not what, that's not what prayer time's about. Amen? It's about considering where you stand with God, not worrying about everybody else. Yeah, that's what this man's doing. He's comparing himself to other people. And when he looks at other people, he sees people who are less than himself. The Bible says in Philippians chapter number 2, to let each esteem other. It says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. If you think you're the best at everything and there's nobody around you that's better than you are, something's wrong. Amen? Amen? Another little application on the side. I think we're doing our kids a disservice 
by convincing them that they're the best. You're, you're smarter than all those other kids. You're better looking than all those other kids. I'm guilty of that one too, right, Maddie? But Have y'all seen her though? I mean, goodness, she's cute. <laughs> But, but, you know, I, I think what we do is we, we pump these kids up and what we're doing is we're convincing them. We're, we're not teaching them to let each esteem other better than themselves. We're teaching them that the goal and objective is to be better than everybody else. And if you live your life that way, you're going to start tearing down other people to accomplish the job. Because if your satisfaction and your fulfillment comes from being better than somebody else, you'll do everything you can to lower them in this life You'll slander them, amen. You'll gossip about them. You'll tear them down at every opportunity to elevate yourself. And we live in a world of people who do that very thing. Right? That's, what, that's one of the things that's wrong in this world. It's people who, who find their, their identity, they find their fulfillment, and how they compare to other people. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse 12 says this. It says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. That's a whole lot of themselves in that verse, right? But y'all got the picture. It's not wise to compare yourself to other people. Amen? We, 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 should just be, we should be looking at Jesus, amen, comparing ourselves to Him. We don't measure up. It'll be, easy, it'll be easy to stay humble when you're comparing yourself to Jesus rather than somebody else. And that goes for a, a family, right? People who try to keep up with the Joneses, amen, try to have, have, have what everybody else has. It could be on an individual level. That can apply to a church trying to be better than somebody else. Better than another church down the road. God forbid that spirit ever gets into this church. It's not wise. We see his confidence, his comparison. Thirdly, we see his commendation. Verse number 12. He commends himself or he approves of himself here in verse 12. He says, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. That's what he's doing. By his commendation is he's, 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 he's referring himself to God. He's recommending himself to God. How arrogant can you possibly be to literally recommend yourself to God? God, I'm not sure if you saw that or not, but I, was, I fasted twice this week. God, have you seen my tithing records? They're pretty good. Right? God, did you remember that thing I did that one time? That was pretty great. There are people who literally think that way. That, that God got something really special when he got me. Because I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I possess. That's a Pharisee. That's the spirit of a Pharisee. Pharisees, by the way, they're strict. You've probably heard this before, but you, you understand what a Pharisee is. It's a strict religious sect of Judaism. And they not only adhere to the law of Moses, but they also adhere to the oral law, right? Or the Mishnah contained in the Talmud. And that's what the Talmud is. It's basically a collection, and that's what they hold to today. The, the Orthodox Jews that, that are over there in Israel and over there in New York and everywhere else they are, that they don't just, they don't just believe the Old Testament and then not believe the New Testament. That they believe the Old Testament, they say they do, but what they really put stock in is the rabbinical writings. Okay, All of these rabbis, all of these preachers, you would say, or priests throughout the ages, have written these commentaries that are basically, they're supposed to be applications of the Old Testament, but what they really are is just traditions of men, right? And by the time Jesus had come along, they had elevated, the Pharisees had elevated the Mishnah or the oral law, they had elevated it to the same position and even above the law of God. They had put their traditions above the law of God. Jesus said that in Mark, in Mark chapter 7, verse number 9. He said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. That's what he's talking about, the Mishnah, the oral law. He said, you Pharisees, y'all prefer your, your tradition over God's word. Matthew 23, 23, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe. Wait a minute, that's what that guy was just bragging about. He said, I must be right with God because I, I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I possess. Jesus says, Ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. For these ought ye to have done 
and not left the other undone. What he's saying is, y'all have, you've been faithful to the outward elements of the law, but you completely missed the spirit of the law. You could comb through these Pharisees' life and not see anything that didn't measure up, outwardly speaking. That's why Jesus said they're whited sepulchers. Outwardly, they look nice. He said on the inside, they're full of dead men's bones. They miss judgment. They miss mercy. Isn't this guy in our text missing mercy? He, he's looking at this public and he has no mercy for him. He has no mercy for the extortioner. He has no mercy for the adulterer or those that are unjust. All he, cares, he, he would prefer them stay where they are because in, in comparison, it makes him look better. That's the, that's the spirit of a Pharisee. Outwardly, they look nice, but they have wicked hearts. And listen, their wicked heart is reflected in their praying. You can learn a lot about somebody by, by, by looking at their prayer life. Amen? That reflects their heart. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Amen? My prayer life is a reflection of what's in my heart. Your prayer life is a reflection of what's in your heart. That's how a Pharisee prays. Let me ask you, do you pray like that? Do you pray confidently? I know the Bible says that we can enter boldly into the throne of grace. Absolutely. But this guy is confident not because, because, because he's not even talking to God. He's talking to himself. When you pray, who are you talking to? If we understood that we're talking to the sovereign God of heaven, Amen. the one that created everything, this entire universe... The one that sent His Son to bleed and die on the old rugged cross so that you and I could be saved. If we realize every time we pray, that's who we're talking to. That's how we're supposed to pray. If not, we're being a Pharisee. Do you pray comparing yourself to other people? Do you pray commending yourself with only your good in mind? That's all He sees. All He sees is the sin in other people and the good in Himself. Because that's all He mentions. I fast twice a week. It's like he's going through his little report card. He said, God, I checked all your boxes, and therefore you must, be, you must be pleased with me. That's how a Pharisee prays. Secondly, we'll see how the publican prays. We look at verse number 13. A publican is just a, a, a tax collector, right? He's a lowly Roman official. By the way, publicans were known. For, they were notorious for exacting more taxes than they were supposed to. They were skimming off the top, basically. This was a class of people who, who generally were, were unjust. They generally were extortioners. And, and that, that, that's, that's generally what they were. But how does he pray? Look in verse number 13. We see his condemnation. Verse 13, it says, In the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven. Everything about this man's posture, and we'll see more in just a moment, but everything about this man's posture conveys the truth that he has rejected and condemned himself. That's a good way to start praying. At the onset of his prayer, he does not need to be convinced that something is wrong with him. He knows something's wrong with him. If this publican had heard the Pharisee praying this publican would have agreed with everything that the Pharisee said. Are you listening? And they're in the same room, and the other guy's praying to be heard of men, so he probably did hear it. The publican's there, and he hears that Pharisee praying and saying, I'm not as other men, and the publican says, yeah, no, he's far better than I am. He hears the publican say that I fast twice a week, and he's sitting there saying, well, I haven't fasted, and I don't think I've ever fasted. And everything that, that the Pharisee says... It, the, the, the publican would agree with. Why? Because he's humble. He says, yeah, I am an extortioner. Yeah, I am unjust. That there's a lot of things wrong with me. You see that in his prayer. The fact that he, his position, he goes and he stands afar off. In his mind, he is unworthy to stand and pray beside that Pharisee. In his mind, I don't, I don't compare. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wicked. I'm worthless. You see that he's dejected. He won't even lift his eyes up. Now the Pharisee's looking around the room figuring out all who he's better than. But the publican has his head bowed low. His eyes are to the ground. And when your eyes are to the ground, then that means your heart is toward God. Amen? When you're looking around at everybody else, 
That, that, that goes to show where your heart is. When this man, the Bible says that he would not so much as lift his eyes to heaven, we know that he has condemned himself and he would not dare look at others, much less at God. He has bowed his head, saying, I'm not better than anybody around me and I sure ain't going to look to heaven. I don't deserve that. Do you see his spirit? Listen, God would much rather receive a prayer from someone who's humble and, and, and has been sinful but knows it than, than a proud Pharisee whose heart is full of sin, whose life meets all the requirements and has no idea that he's not right with God. Which one would you rather be? I'd rather be the publican. Amen? I'd much rather be the publican. We see his condemnation. Secondly, we see his contrition. Verse number 13, it says that he standing afar off, he would not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven. Then it says, but smote upon his breast. Barnes said this, Albert Barnes, she said that this is an expression of grief and anguish in view of his sins. And it is a sign of grief among all nations. What that signifies is, think about this, when he is smiting his breast, what, he is, he, what he's doing is he's acknowledging the source of his sin. He, he, he's not blaming the devil, right? He's not blaming the Pharisee. When, when, he, when he smites his chest, what he's saying is, I'm to blame. Right? James chapter 1 lets us know that, right? That it's our flesh that is the source of sin. It comes from us. And what he's doing is, by smiting his flesh, he, he, he's showing and outwardly, he's expressing an inward battle against his flesh. He's saying, my flesh is my biggest problem. And he, he's contrite about that. It'd be a glad day in your life when you realize your flesh is your biggest problem. It's not everybody else's flesh. It's not, it's not the people that you think are your enemies. It's not the boss man, right? The person who causes you the most problems is you. The person that causes me the most problems is me. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 7, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members. He's talking about his body. Warring against the law of my mind. That's what we see in him smiting his breast. You see the law of his mind warring against the law in his members. He says, And bring me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You see that in his prayer that he is, he is fighting against his flesh. Galatians says that the spirit lusteth against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit, right? And that they're contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. Your flesh doesn't want to pray. A big amen go right there. Your flesh don't want to pray. My flesh does not want to pray. And so as this man approaches prayer, what does he do? He smites his breast. It's a picture and lets us know that you're going to have to fight your flesh to pray. If you're going to have a prayer life, you're going to have to crucify your flesh. We see his contrition. We also see his confession. In there, verse number 13, he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He's confessing who he is. He's realized that in the eyes of God, he doesn't measure up and he doesn't compare. He doesn't try to impress God. Most of us, when you're, when you're talking to someone, you want to put your best foot forward. You want to put, you want to put your, your, you know, your accolades out front. You want, you, want, you want people to look at you and see the best that you have. That's not how you pray. Are you with me? That's not how you pray. Amen. He just goes ahead and tells the truth. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. God, God is not, and, and what the other guy did was the Pharisee, he started going through his areas of service. God's not going to be bribed by service. We can't earn the merit of God. We can't earn the mercy of God. We can't earn justification, which is what we're going to talk about here in a second. That's what Jesus said that, that these two people were aiming to, to receive. Who's going to be justified? The one who tries to impress God with all the good things that he's done or the one who's honest about his sin and begs for mercy? Who you think gets justified? 
he just, he's confessing. He's open and honest. He says, I am a sinner and I need mercy. I am a sinner and I need mercy. You are a sinner and you need mercy. Amen? Amen? That's what we need. A sinner, I, never, I don't think I've ever actually even looked this up in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. It defines the word sinner as this. One that has voluntarily violated the divine law. A moral agent who has voluntarily disobeyed any divine precept or neglected any known duty. That's what a sinner is. You willingly and knowingly disobey the divine law. I've done that today. You've done that today, right? Your, fle- your flesh desires to do that. does it every day. Your flesh is wicked. Paul said, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And the moment that you and I can be honest about that and stop trying to, to impress God with, with, with the little things that we do, God would be much more inclined to reach out and to help and to give mercy and to give grace to those who will be honest about where we stand with Him. Amen? And what it is that we need. In a moment, we're going to have an invitation to pray. And when we do that, you're going to have a decision to make as to how you're going to pray. Are we going to pray like the Pharisee? Are you listening? Are we going to pray like the Pharisee? Arrogantly comparing ourselves to other people, considering only the good things that we've done. That's a tip. Listen, we're all prone to do that. That pulls on every one of us. We're going to pray like the Pharisee, or are we going to pray like the publican? Humbly, repenting of sin, and begging God for mercy. Maybe this will help us decide. Look in verse 14. He says, I tell you, this man, speaking of the publican, right? This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Miss Alicia, if you'll move towards the piano, let's humble ourselves before the Lord. Let's pray like the publican. Let's ask for God to give mercy. Amen? Mercy for our homes, mercy for our lives, mercy for this church. Let's ask for God to help us. Amen? I'm going to find a place of prayer. I encourage you all to do the same.